Today, I would like to talk about crafting services, how we can design delightful experiences through physical and digital human-centered systems. What we'll be covering today is first looking at what a service is, defining it and better understanding its, its background. And then we'll look at how Disney, Lyft, Airbnb, and some other service businesses like Nordstrom deliver really excellent services. And then lastly, I'd like to talk a bit about how to design services using some common design frameworks like storyboards and blueprints. So to kick it off, let's talk a bit about what service is. And something that quickly comes to mind is simply helping or doing something for someone else. A lot of service wrapped up in my mind is around giving, like uh, volunteering or church service. And maybe it's something like helping someone achieve their goal. If someone's trying to get from point A to point B, or someone's trying to learn something, a uh, service is to help them move from their current state to a future desired state or their end goal. In economics, there's a bit of a different term for what service is, and there's four key components. One is that it's perishable. It's gone after you use it. If you don't sell it today, it's not coming back. So you can think of a hotel room or a seat in a, in a dining table at a restaurant. If you don't sell that seat at the 7 p.m. time, you're not going to get that back. And if you don't sell the hotel room tonight, you're not going to get that back either. And then intangible, it can't be touched or it can't be taken out of the shop. It, it happens at, at the interaction. You can't necessarily see it. It's often an interaction between two people. And it's not like a hard material good that you can carry around and show off to your friends. Oftentimes it's really variable, and that has to do with this human element involved. Uh, services are often between two people, and because people are different than all the other people in the world, the, the service interaction is vastly different as opposed to buying an iPhone and your first experience turning it on is exactly the same, or even to a, a certain extent, um, going and picking up a, a burger at McDonald's, that, that product, that tangible thing that you get is the same every time. And the last part is that it's inseparable and you can't take away the service from the moment that it happens. So that time that you went to Disney, you can't bottle that up and take it home except for artifacts of the service like pictures or memories that you share with your friends. So what we've seen, in production, especially in the Western economy, is this really big evolution towards a service economy. So if you were to start, especially in America, and look at its evolution and its economy in production, it first started off with a lot of resources, that water job you see here, or the vast amounts of minerals or, or forests that we can then mine or cut down. So that tends to be the, the first economy, is just extraction of the raw materials and goods. And then the next big economy is agriculture, uh, growing the, the food that then fuels the economy. Then in the, the turn of the century, we saw a really big shift from agriculture in America to manufacturing. We're now making more and more complex goods out of all the raw materials and even to a certain extent, the food that was coming out and producing more complex foods. Then the, the big breakthrough in manufacturing recently was around the, the computer and the advent of a very, very complex product, something that is getting on the edge of even uh, human complexity. And then a lot of effort lately has been designing services now that we've built all these complexities in the materials and um, the, the growth in the manufacturing of physical products in America has slowed down. We're seeing a really big growth in the, the service sector of the economy. And then the last step, just the pure opposite of a raw material, would be uh, Disney designing an experience that is basically 100% service and entertainment, and it has no real hard uh, goods or product that comes along with it. So what we'll be talking about today is this ever complex product that's coming into the world, the computer and especially the mobile phone, and then something that's a service. In this example, a taxi getting from point A to point B, there's no hard good in it. 
and how we can start combining these in uh, service and service design. Lyft just being one example of something that combines a very complex uh, product with a pretty complex service and binds them together to create a really delightful uh, service experience that couldn't have existed 50, 100 years ago. So if we were to rewind to 1960 and we were to look at the Western economy, that's Western Europe, Americas, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and we were to look at all employments in the services, about 53% of the Western economy was wrapped up in the, the service economy. Now, if we were to fast forward to 2017, that 53% has now grown dramatically to 80% of all employment is in the services. And during that same time, we have a massive population growth. And so the combination of the growing percent and also the growing size of the Western economy accounts for a lot more people doing services than before in 1960, and especially before that, when we were mostly a agricultural society. So if we were to break down the 80%, especially in the United States, so what does that look like and how is it broken into the, the different parts of the service economy? The, the biggest one is healthcare. And that's uh, almost 25% of the service economy is in uh, health services, education, hospitals, even pharmaceuticals. And then we were to look at the, the next one in there, and that's professional and business services at 20%. And that would be our digital agencies, accountants, lawyers, business services, or, or even just cleaning a home or tidying up your home. That's a professional service that you're, you're outsourcing or you're letting someone else do a, a skilled labor or trade for you. Then if we go up to the top, uh, hospitality and leisure, Disney would definitely fall into that category. That's lodging, food, entertainment, Retail has had a lot of growth in the, in the recent uh, decade or so, and, and that would be different um, shops and, and online retail. And then the, the last few places that we'll touch on today is around transportation, moving things or people from point A to point B, and then uh, financial services, helping with returns or whatever they may be. So let's take a look at some of those different services throughout the wheel. And the first one I'd like to touch on is Disney. So Disney, as we all know, runs a lot of really excellent theme parks along with the, the shows and the different entertainment products they put out there. And what I'd like to talk about today is the Magic Band, as you can see here. And what it allows you to do now is instead of waiting in line, you can now have the magic band that is your fast pass. It's the entrance to your parks. You can even start uh, unlocking your hotel room. So we see this merging of an experience and then mapping on a new experience with new technologies like the magic band and their, their different app to be able to see how busy rides are to hopefully create a more seamless and enjoyable experience when you're in the park. And John uh, Padig, or Pad Get, sorry, um, who is the chief experience and innovation officer who helped with the, the design of this, has recently moved to Carnival Cruises, where he's essentially installing the very similar concept to the, the Magic Band just for buying drinks and doing activities along uh, cruise ships. And next on the retail side is Zappos. So in 1999, one of the co-founders looked at the footwear industry in the U.S. and said, you know what, this is a $40 billion market, and 5% of all of that market is already being sold by paper mail and, and order catalogs. And he saw a really big opportunity to have people shop at home. But the, the big fear was um, around returns and just the whole entire experience of trying shoes on hold. Uh, home. So they made a really awesome return policy, really excellent service culture of no questions asked for, for returns and, and making those returns free. And so they, they built on the technology of a very simple online store 
with a, a product that you can now buy anywhere, but instead of going to the store, you, you buy it at home. So they designed a, a different experience and it grew really fast and it sold to uh, Amazon in 2009. And the other example in the retail space is Nordstrom's. So Nordstrom is a, a brick and mortar store with a online component. And for a long time, those two have lived entirely separately. What they just realized, or what they just uh, released in a Westfield Century City in the Los Angeles metro area is something called uh, Nordstrom Local. And what it allows you to do is first start your shopping experience online, which a lot of Nordstrom customers are now doing. And then it allows you to pick up in store. There's alterations. There's a nail and beauty salon on site. So this picture you can see here is nothing is bought in store. It's all for trying on and lookbooks. You're really starting your service experience online. And then coming into the store, you can see the alterations, talking with the personal stylists and the store design. So we're seeing this redesign of the service experience from online moving into the, the physical world and then redesigning the physical world to match that new experience and design. On the transportation side, you could also put this in the hospitality side is Lyft. So something that I find interesting about Lyft is that Logan Green, one of the co-founders, grew up in, in Santa Monica and he was really tired of the bad LA transit and seeing all the cars parked on the street in, in Los Angeles and thinking to himself, man, 95% of the time these cars are just sitting around and they're not really doing anything good and they're taking up all of our, our urban space. What if we can redesign the, the car experience to basically have cars more productive and to have it easier to move around space without having to find parking and having to go around the block 10 times and just getting really frustrated with the whole entire experience of, of moving around in Los Angeles and and in other cities in, in America. So he, he paired up with uh, John Zimmer from the, the Cornell Hotel School, and together they created a Zimride, which then became a Lyft, and the, the rest is history from there, except for recently, where you're looking at the, the battle between Lyft and Uber, really similar product, uh, similar cars, similar moving from point A to point B, and pretty similar app, but the, the whole entire culture is completely different and the, the drivers are, are different as well. And I think a lot of that has to do with uh, service and expectations. As you can see here, here's a picture of um, someone sitting in the front seat and talking to the driver and there's this expectation in the, in the lift of being social and having the, the passenger sit in the front seat and interact with the driver and, and really bringing down the barriers of a traditional taxi setup, which uh, Uber seems to to come from and and try to still instill. And then Ally Bank. So Ally is a completely online bank backed up by a really excellent uh, customer support team. So here's the the app in the the background. But as you can see, we we have the the number and the current wait time for the call center. So I've been using Ally Bank because I I move around a lot. And this isn't a screenshot of my bank account, by the way, just a, a general Google image. But the, the thing about banks now is that a lot of the interactions, the deposits, and the payments are all moving online. So what happens to the brick and mortar experience? Uh, some are redesigning that experience and the in-store experience. Others, like, like Ally, are saying, nope, we, we don't need a brick and mortar we can just back it up by really good customer service because people um, want that 24 hours call center anyways. So they're, they're not gonna come into the, the brick and mortar bank in the first place. And what they're able to do by that is cut down costs for having an onsite location and offer the, the best returns that, that you see out there on, on the market for uh, bank accounts and, and savings. Next on the professional service side is Bench. And what Bench is, if you haven't heard of it, is it's a combination of both an accounting software and also a professional service team of accountants and bookkeepers who are able to help you out month to month. So what it's doing is 
it's combining professional services and SaaS software as a services and making something I like to call a professional as a service. So we're, we're seeing this mixing of, of software and the professional side and the, the business services component. And then at Accelo, really similar thing happening. This is where I work. What we're doing is we're combining, again, a, a technology that you're able to track projects and ongoing works between a digital agency or a consultancy and their clients. And then building an, a service layer where they can have this two-way communication through client portals and through email to give project updates and to manage that, that ongoing services side. So we're, we're seeing both Bench and Accelo facilitating this communication and primarily facilitating online communication. A lot of the professional service firms we work with aren't walking in to clients. Clients aren't coming on site. They have this international footprint and they're able to work out from New Zealand, but still have clients like Coca-Cola and Atlanta without ever meeting face-to-face, -face, but mediated through something like Accelo and a lot of other apps like Slack and Zoom. Next on the healthcare side is Forward. And Forward started in San Francisco and just recently extended to Los Angeles. And what Forward does is it combines a healthcare and proactive tracking application and basically a electronic health record so that they can provide better services and identify when illnesses are, are about to happen so that you can stay healthier. So here we see a, a doctor interaction and what I haven't shown here is also an iPhone app and a, uh, a desktop app that the, uh, the lady over here can keep track of her health and send updates to her doctor. And here the doctor is um, basically looking at the, the electronic health record and suggesting some improvements for, for her health. So we're seeing this, this blending of, of technology and really a technology first healthcare company and then backing that up with really excellent doctor services and even being able to improve their services because of the technology. Next is a Salesforce Health Cloud. So what they're, they're able to do with the Salesforce, which is a CRM, but it's basically, in this case, a customer service or patient journey success platform, is all the way from uh, marketing to managing when things go wrong to then having ongoing engagement, one system that underpins everything, and then all the, the services built on top of that, whether they're um, electronic services that remind you to go into your doctors or whether it's face-to-face -face services like you're seeing here, a, a doctor physically interacting with you in the, the doctor's office. Both of those are starting to blend together into one care package, which is both person and technology mediated. Moving into the hospitality and leisure space is Airbnb. So with Airbnb, what we see is a technology or app first, a really seamless booking experience and searching experience. And then with a, a service that goes along with it because we now open up our, our homes to a whole bunch of individuals, we're able to have that personal face-to-face -face and basically unbranded uh, hotel experience. And what it allows us to do is decentralize from brands in the 1950s, we have Holiday Inn and the centralization of a hotel experience, mainly around uh, safety and brand recognition. So in, when the, the highways were expanding in America and you were going into a town that you didn't recognize, it's really scary to stay at the, the little motel that's local and with a little flashing, flickering light, similar to the Bates Motel. So seeing a Holiday Inn that's bright and clean and you know you can trust and be safe and sleep for the night, was a really big deal. But you're seeing Airbnb do a similar thing on the, the trust side, but then bringing down the, the brand or breaking down the, the brand barriers where you're able to have this really personal experience like you're living there while maintaining this trusted network of good communications backed up by Airbnb, nice photos to be able to know what you're getting yourself into, all mediated by a technology, a review system, and then a company that's behind it.
And then the last one that we will touch on is Phil's coffee. So here's uh, Phil himself pouring a cup of coffee one, one at a time. And Phil started in the mission in San Francisco and since then has moved through most of uh, California. And we'll be touching more on the difference between Phil's and some of the other coffees out there. But uh, as you can see here, it's a, an app. Phil's didn't build it, but it's an order ahead app that allows you to beat the Phil's line, pick up your coffee on the go. And it's identifying the, the difference between going to work, you order through a mobile app and you might have a completely separate experience than if you were wanting to sit down in the Phil's and maybe waiting in line is part of your experience ordering, having a conversation with the barista as he or she makes it right in front of you. That's a totally different experience in, in brand than going through the app, which is digitally mediated, and I'm trying to go a lot faster. So now that we've looked at some services and those with a really strong technology underpinning, what is service design? So I like to think of service design as, in general, part of this human-centered interaction and technology side. So what I mean by human-centered interaction is we're thinking about the, the people that are involved within the technology first, and in this case, especially the, the user, and designing really delightful experiences for them uh, using the product or interacting with the services. So when someone says UX or user experience design, I like to think of it as a broad category up here with then two components. One being services, what we're talking about today, and then the other component being product. And then product can even be broken down into the digital and the physical side. The digital product being the app they interact with, the physical side being the, the phone or the computer or even the, the coffee maker. So when people are advertising UX and hiring for UX, they're, they're really looking for someone who can design a digital product and the user experience that relates to that. Whereas when someone's talking about service design, we're talking about designing the, the service side of, of that product all under user experience design. So really in, in my mind, UX should be up here, but in practice and in the, the hiring side, we're seeing today that UX is actually down here. So service design is within the, the UX field. It just depends on who you're talking to, where it belongs in this fishbone diagram. And then other people like to use Venn diagrams and maybe it's more like this. UX is in the middle and there's service and then customer experience design and then UX uh, physical product design on the other side or even architecture and, and industrial design. So there, there's a lot of uh, confusion, a lot of debate on where service design and UX and, and all this fits together. But what I like to lean on is a really good video by Ford, and Ford's a service design consultancy. And I think they do a really good job of explaining what service design is. So let's hop over to that for just a sec, watch the uh, two to three minute video, and then we'll go on from there. What is service design? I've been thinking about this for a while, and I recently discovered a brilliant quote by Mark Futine that I think sums it up perfectly. When you have two coffee shops right next to each other, each selling the exact same coffee for the exact same price, service design is the reason you go into one coffee shop and not the other. So let's play that out in a little scenario. Coffee shop A decide they want a mobile app. So they put a team full of people together to work on it for a couple of months before delivering it to their customers. The customers download the app, only to find it's got nothing that they need. Now let's look at Coffee Shop B. Coffee Shop B put the customer at the heart of the experience. They talk to them. 
They do some immersive research and really get to know what the customer's doing before, during, and after their coffee. They can map this out on a customer journey, where they identify the highs and lows of the experience, and uncover some service opportunities, and can start to explore solutions. The team then start to speak to other people from around the business. They speak to the colleagues in store and understand what their day looks like. They speak to the founder to look back at the original vision for the coffee shop, as well as the marketing team and the suppliers too. Once they have all of these people together, they can run a workshop or a series of workshops where they can identify the real business objective and exactly what they want to achieve. They can start to design some concepts and test them with the customers they now have a relationship with. They can do a tech analysis and plot everything on a blueprint that documents all of the support systems necessary to bring these concepts to life. With all this, they can create their North Star vision, all resulting in a mobile app full of features that customers love. But it doesn't stop there. They've also identified that colleagues need a tablet application to help them deal with the extra flow of traffic in store and the payment system needs updating so all three can work in harmony. They might design a colleague training and engagement program and redesign their store to optimise the physical experience too, whilst also looking at how they talk about themselves socially, possibly even introducing some new product lines. These are what we call the front stage experiences. But in order for it to all come together, we must look at the backstage too. Here you will find the backend systems that drive all the digital propositions, key metrics that we measure ourselves by, learn from and iterate upon the services, as well as a CRM system and some delivery partners. So, service design is about three things. One, customer centric. It's about putting the customer at the heart of everything you do, and only then will you create services people love. Two, co-creation. It's about exploring and designing these concepts together. And as a result, you will ensure services are both technically feasible and business viable. Three, holistic. It's about building interdependent, interrelated experiences that all connect with people on an emotional level. That way, you will create services that scale beyond the original idea. To round it all off, let's revisit Mark's quote. Service design is not just what makes you walk into one coffee shop and not the other. It's the reason you keep coming back and tell all your friends about it. All right, great. So what we'll do is we'll we'll look at those two coffee shops, but instead of being coffee shop A and coffee shop B, we'll look at Starbucks versus Phil's Coffee. And the, the first activity we'll do is storyboarding the customer journey and having that first initial map of really understanding what sort of steps that they're taking through the, the experience. So the, the first experience of coffee is feeling like you need the, the caffeine or going through your morning commute. And so the, the first thing that comes to mind is being able to see the storefront or finding the parking and walking into the store. And then the next stage in line is, is going into the line, queuing up, seeing the, the different menus, and maybe starting to hear the sounds and smell the coffee that's in a Starbucks. And then the, the next stage would be putting in your order. So here we have Jed who takes your order and you order decaf latte with two pumps of vanilla. And something that you may notice in Starbucks is that when you order out of order or when you say large, they'll slightly correct you and say vente or grande. So they, they have their own coding system that's built behind. So you can think of those as the support processes so that they can easily pass off your order to the baristas who are making it. And then there might be some sort of credit card transaction. It used to be that you hand the credit card to them. Now, with the technology underpinning it, you can use Apple Pay or, or use your chip on the front end and sign with your finger rather than uh, manually signing a, a printed receipt. So that's a small change with technology too that alleviates that interaction between you and the, the teller or the cashier. And then you can watch Jimmy make his, or your, uh, latte. 
And then lastly, either he's passing it off or someone is at the end calling out all the drinks, passing them off to you with a, a smile. And then you grab the drink, and in this case, uh, you might sit there all day on your two computers and, and work remotely for the, the next 12 hours. So an activity that you can do, and if you want to put this on pause, is do a storyboarding activity. So the, the goal of this activity is to be able to look at a service experience and then create a service system artifact. In this case, it would be a storyboard. So what you can do is think about your last visit to Phil's or a similar coffee shop, just something that's different than Starbucks. And take a sheet of paper. It's easiest if you fold it three times and you can make six little scenes of your story. And then you can sketch out the entire client or customer journey from the moment I need caffeine to drinking or, or throwing away the, the drink. And something to keep in mind is the senses, the smells, and all of the things that, that happen in your customer journey. So now that we've gone through that activity, we can all regroup and talk about some of the similarities and, and differences. One of the, the biggest ones that we found in our, our past classes is that in Phil's, you get the coffee or you order the coffee first with the barista and then you pay later. So there's definitely some training that goes along, but it aligns more with what you need. Um, I'm there to get coffee and order that first rather than to pay first. And there's an entire different uh, customer interaction. When you're talking to the barista, you're getting to see and smell the coffee rather than ordering out a POS system and then getting your coffee later. Some of the, the other things on, on Starbucks is having a bigger menu and a clearer menu. You don't feel as left out as at a Phil's where you have to ask people around for some of the, the workflows. And then Phil's is built on a, a big trust system. So after you order your coffee, you can technically just loiter around and, and get your coffee. Rather than at Starbucks, it's more procedural. There's more customers who go through it. So you're definitely paying before you pick up your coffee. So those are just some differences that we've seen in the past. Now the, the next section, moving on from storyboarding, is looking at service blueprints. And service blueprints are the main artifact that we can use, sort of like mapping out a, a hotel or even just say a house. Blueprints in the physical space are meant for mapping those out. A service blueprint is meant to map out something that we said was intangible or not necessarily able to see easily, service blueprints help us visualize the service and then look for areas in improving. Instead of moving walls like an architectural blueprint for a home, we're moving service experiences. So changing the length and delay, changing training, changing part of the technology to make the services more delightful and valuable for the customers and for the providers as well. So the first thing to think about for a service blueprint is roughly how it's designed. And a lot of the times practitioners like to think of it as a production or as a theater performance where there's the audience or the, the guests who are sitting here in the chairs. There's the people putting on performance on stage and that's the, the front stage performance. And then there's this curtain that hides all the backstage productions like all the people dressed up in black doing lights and sound changing props makeup all the support services that go into this including the the scripts and the writers and the the orchestra that you don't necessarily see when you put on production so likewise in a service experience when you're putting on a, a production it's not always a theatrical performance but the easiest one to think about is Disney, which more or less is a theatrical performance of a service in and in an entertainment. So here we have the front stage experience where the, the cast members, those are employees of Disney, interact with the guest. This is my favorite front stage experience. This is Cars Land. And this is an aerial of Disneyland. So as you can see here, this is all the front stage of Tom Sawyer's Island and Space Mountain and Main Street USA and Indiana Jones. A lot of the square footage of Disney is in this backstage area. 
So here's all the backstage, all the support services that make this really magical. And then furthermore, underneath all of this are tunnels and different hidden entrances that help people move around and our additional support services for putting on that production on the front stage. So if you want to take a look, the Imagineers have a really good Tumblr. Here's some historical footage of, of backstage. And here's some other funny photos of backstage with people with their costumes off and socializing. Something that you would never want your guests to see because the, the magic would be gone. So when you're designing a service blueprint for Disney or whatever service organization that you're looking at, there's three uh, lines to keep an eye on. One of those is the line of interaction. So if you think of a theatrical performance, this would be where the stage meets the seating, where the service provider meets the customer. In the Starbucks example, this would be at the POS or at that counter. And then we have the line of visibility. This is where the curtain, where the customer can no longer uh, actively interact with the provider, but might be able to see a little bit into the backstage. So the, the curtain is the, in the Starbucks example, would be the espresso machines and the, the trays and the little case for all the, the pastries. And that is a sort of a physical curtain that separates you from one stage to another. And in Disney, you can't see any of the backstage action. So the curtains are the fake walls and the hedges and everything that hides the, the guests from the backstage. And the last point is the line of internal interaction. So this is absolutely hidden from the customer site and is often hidden from the employee site as well. And those are all the support processes that are behind. So to define some of these areas, time, Sometimes it's a function of emotion. This is mapped over the days or the hours, so it shows you how long an interaction takes. The evidence is really important for services because like we said, services are intangible, so you need some sort of evidence that a service is happening. So these are often the physical objects, oftentimes people, cars, even the, the phones and technology that are, are part of the service experience. Then the customer journey is the actions the customer takes to achieve their goals and what they're trying to do along the service interaction. Next, we have the front stage. So these are the things that the customer can see, the actions the employees are doing to help the customer achieve their goals. And then any digital touch points that are more customer facing. So in a Starbucks example, this would be the POS and the credit card readers in Disney, This maybe the, the little magic band and the fast pass. Next is past the curtain. This is where the organization's employees, uh, what they do to deliver on the front stage. So in Starbucks, they're grinding the beans, they're shipping or getting the beans from the back of house to the front of house, making sure that we have enough cups to be able to make really awesome lattes. And then lastly, the support process is everything that underpins so in a built environment, that's the store, it's all the training, it's the point of sale system and all the technology that is able to get coffee beans from Costa Rica into the, the store in Starbucks. And then for the, the Disney example, it might be uh, the, the technology platform, so the magic band that underpins everything or maybe the, the check-in check-out gates. <clears throat> so if we were to look at uh, Nordstrom or just buying anything experience, it might start on a website. That might be the evidence. Moves to the retail location and meeting an employee. It's checking out with a credit card and then eventually getting the appliance or in the Nordstrom case, the, the shoes that you're looking to buy. And then all the pieces down below. So here's what a, a Starbucks interaction may look like if you were to draw with pen and paper like I did, the physical evidence being the store and the barista and the coffee that comes out the, at the end, the customer interaction like parking, waiting in line, and then going through picking up your drink, the front stage actions that the employee takes, so greeting the customer, asking for payment, the backstage actions which allow things to go smoothly and keep on running like cleaning, 
Um, like I said, receiving and codifying the order. So that's translating your large into a vente into the Starbucks language. And then support processes, like really nicely designed stores and branding, a, a system to be able to read the credit card that you give them so that you can go to the next stage and pick up your drink. So oftentimes these support systems or service blueprint will have a lot of uh, technology that's integrated into that. So that's why we've been talking about technology so much because increasingly the actions that an employee and a uh, customer take are mediated through technology and a lot of the support processes now are helped by big uh, information systems. And then something that you can start doing on the service blueprint is identifying places or pain points in a customer journey or even in the support processes. So in the Starbucks case, waiting in line is often the most time that you spend and is the most boring and unrewarding part of the service experience. So what they did was they identified that and similar to the example that Fjord um, put out, it's develop a mobile app so you don't have to wait in line any longer. So you can order ahead of time, skip the line, and pick up the drink. The service experience is a little bit less in the store, but also you're getting your product faster, and the, the service or the negative experience of waiting in line is greatly diminished. Uh, another place that Starbucks identified as a uh, place to improve is around the physical evidence. So in high school, when I was working at Starbucks, there was a big change. Howard Schultz had just come back to Starbucks to try to revitalize the brand. And they noticed that what the customers wanted to see was more physical evidence of the barista making the product and putting craft and quality into that. So one of the things that the customers didn't like is how thick the line of visibility was, how high the, um, the espresso machines were hiding the barista and hiding the, the craft that they're putting into it. So what they did was they brought the, the espresso and the coffee makers down a little so that the barista could then interact with the customer, similar to how the Phil's experience is. You're talking with them, you're interacting, you're not hiding behind a massive espresso machine. It's more uh, personal and interactive, and therefore you enjoy the coffee more, you enjoy the experience of coming to Starbucks more, and it's more valuable, the three fifty or whatever you pay for your latte or, or coffee. So that's looking at some examples of a service blueprint for Starbucks. Now what we'll do in this activity, and it tends to be around the 20 to 40 minute activity, is to redesign a service that's closer to home for you, if you don't like Starbucks that much, using the blueprint technique that we just went through. So a successful activity in the past is having groups go into a Lyft team or an Airbnb team or whatever service that's really heavily um, technology mediated. Map those out on a whiteboard. And then similar to what I've done with those little red marks on the, the blueprint for Starbucks is to identify areas of improvement and then redesign some of those areas using the front stage, uh, backstage, and the, the customer journey interaction points. And then the last part that I want to discuss is around the tools that you can use, the online tools that you can use instead of sticky notes and white paper, or <laughs> white paper, whiteboards. So one is an online sticky note and whiteboarding app called Mural, and it's really easy to drag and drop. You can make comments and share with your internal team or with clients, so that's been helpful. Sketch is the universal tool to map out a user experience UX in its digital product form, not general user experience. So allowing to design the app and see how it interacts with, with people. Sketch is the, the forefront of that. And then Draw.io or Lucidchart, they're similar. Some people have affinity for one versus the other. To be able to map out user flows and work charts and that service blueprint, I found the most success using a Lucidchart or Draw.io. And the last thing that I want to leave you with is some additional good stuff. If you're interested in the academic side of it, Rohi Verma is a, an excellent researcher and professor at the Cornell Hotel School. And some of his academic articles have been really helpful for me to better understand services from a more uh, operational 
perspective. And then also from uh, coming out of a, a service school. The Slack group, Practical Service Design, is an open community if you want to interact with other people in the field, read articles that they're posting, and that, that video from Fjord was, was in it. Some of the, the companies that are leading the space, Fjord, we've talked about them. Ideo is an excellent one. They put some really good blocks together. Also, the, the co-founder of Ideo started the Stanford D School, the design school. Wikipedia is definitely your friend. This is a newer space, so looking at service design and all the articles that they've referenced. Uh, IDL, uh, ITIL service design is more of the tech uh, approach, like IT consultants will reference that when they're improving services. And then lastly, service systems is more of a, a human system approach. And then lastly, I would just like to thank Mechi. I, I was able to borrow her really awesome designs, like this little one here, but throughout the, the PowerPoint, she was able to, to lend me her, her awesome designs for this presentation. So thank you everyone, and I'll leave it on this slide. Here's my contact information if you'd like to reach out to me to, to learn more about service design, share thoughts, ideas, or just have a conversation. So.